after d4, d5, c4, knight, c6, white might play the move c5. Now, this doesn't only happen against the Chigorin, but it might happen in plenty other d4 games. When there's d4 and d5, white can play this idea of c5 with the idea of potentially playing b4 and expand on the queen side. How to face this type of idea? Black now plays e5 immediately because we're going to have to start targeting white's closed center. So the d4 pawn now, there's double attack on the d4 pawn. So what should white do? Two main ideas here. One of them is e3 which seems to be making sense. The other one is knight to f3, reinforcing the attack over e5. So remember, when they play this type of pawn center, just attack it straight away, because you gotta dismantle it. The only thing that the white player is waiting for in such a type of game is to play a3 and then b4, and then you don't even know what to do. Your knight's looking a bit silly in c6, and you can't really play b6 with the hope of achieving anything. So here's the move, e5. And after knight f3, we're also gonna go through e3. Now, because the pawn in d4 is not defended by a pawn, you take it, because white will have to take back with the piece, but obviously the knight, but now we will just win a pawn in c5. There's no compensation for white, and so the, this is basically a silly line, that's why I've kept it for the beginning of the video, so we can move on to the more serious line straight after this. Let's just see a few best moves by both players to see how the setup should look like. After white takes knight, it's fine that we have this double pawn, it's not the end of the world. White now playing queen to c2, the best move, which targets the bishop, and if you move the bishop, you lose the pawn in c6, meaning that that was, that, that was the line that white was going for. However, queen to d6 holds everything, and after white's best move, which is e4, the idea, of course, is that if we take, then we will have this c double isolated pawns. Black, of course, plays knight to f6, reinforcing the attack over e4, and after pawn takes, kind of the only move. Here, we give back the extra pawn that we have by castling, and after capturing back in d5, black will have an important pawn advantage. Of course, the white player can't really take the pawn in c6 because you do have too many threats. You have rook a, e8 check, king can't move anywhere, so he's gonna have to block. If he blocks with the bishop, he can take, and after pawn takes back and rook takes back, it's gonna be a joke to finish this game. If he blocks with the bishop, you can exploit the pin, so obviously you can play something like even bishop a6 we could do here, and even after knight c3, you can literally do whatever you want here. Even bishop f2 check, king takes, and now queen c5 check. It's going to be game over. The king has nowhere to go. If he goes to f1, you can just take the bishop, for example. The knight is pinned, otherwise he will lose the queen. The white player will lose the queen. If the king goes back to e1, then plenty of ideas. You can even just take the bishop. So let's go back in this position. Set is not suggested to take the pawn. After bishop e2, now we can take the pawn back. And after castle and rook to e8, luck is just better. We're up a pawn. And this is also a passed pawn. After knight c3 and queen e5, best moves. The white player will have nowhere to really put this dark square bishop. e3, there's double, there's triple attack on it. f4 gets taken, g5 gets taken, and so on. So after bishop to d2. And by the way, it's important to notice that rook e1 in this type of position is a silly move. Because the rook is undefended. It's not connected with the other rook. And there's not the usual knight in f3, which protects the rook. So basically... In this position, this is a weakness, so knight g4 wins on the spot for black because you're targeting h2, you're targeting f2, so white can't really save all of these things at the same time. So let's say bishop to d2, going on with development, and now the white player is threatening to simply develop the rooks in the perfect places, but now it's too late because black plays d4, and the knight can't go in e4 or d5, it gets taken, and, well, if he goes anywhere else, then we have double attack on the bishop in e2. We don't have to worry about white playing some skewer type of move because the, our rook is defended by our knight. The only move by white now to try and counterattack would be knight to e4 attacking our bishop, but still black plays bishop to, be, to d6. Now we have still double threat on the bishop in e2, whilst we have a threat of checkmate. And back in this position, white cannot have the option of playing f4 to counterattack the queen because you can simply take the knight with check by the bishop. And one last thing, if white plays knight to b5, it is true that white has double attack on the bishop in e2, but also the queen will be attacking the bishop in c5. And yes, then we can take this bishop, but the white player will have some counterplay, especially after the move knight to c7. This is not looking particularly good. So the best move here is d3, which attacks the queen and the bishop. So if the queen goes to d3, then we will have double attack on e2 without having to worry about our dark square bishop. If instead the bishop goes to d3, 
Then knight to g4 threatens checkmating one move. We had to play knight to g4 now because earlier there was a bishop in e2. By the way, bishop h7 does nothing. You just move the king. There's nothing here. The threat is still there. And obviously g3 doesn't block anything because you can play queen h5 with the threat of checkmate and also the threat of winning a piece. So in this position after knight g4, if white plays g3, well obviously queen h5. And after h4, bishop to b7 is a very strong move, ignoring the fork of the knight in c7, of course. So let's say, for example, knight c7, okay, knight f2, with a threat of extremely powerful discover check. Best reply would be rook takes, but still, queen to f3 now is the final blow. Too many may threats at the same time, the checkmate is unstoppable. You've also got queen g3. So from the start, d4, d5, c4, knight c6, and then they might play this pawn structure that I used to find annoying when I didn't really know how to tackle it. So e5, what happens after e3? Okay, block continues with the key move, knight g to e7. Obviously, needless to say, the pawn taken in e5 will be just completely wrong because after you take back, white has just wasted a lot of moves to have nothing in exchange. So we're not going to look at that after knight e7. Now we're going to look at three options. One of them is g3 to put the bishop in fianchetto. The other one is knight f3, the other one is b4. So let's look at b4 first because it's a crazy line that I wanted to show. Okay, you take the pawn here and if white takes back, there's basically nothing. You just win a pawn. This is not one of those positions where the white player can play rook b1 with an attack on b7 or something like that. This is literally just a completely pointless sacrifice. Black's position is evaluated at minus 150 or something like that simply because there's just nothing and the white player will never be able to really reinforce this pawn structure and reserves for himself, for himself ideas like knight c6. Potentially later on knight f5, you're always going to be able to put pressure on this backward pawn because this is a stupid opening. A uh, move like queen a4, you just play knight back. There's nothing. So let's continue once again from that line of b4. So c5, e5. Okay, e3, knight g to e7. So let's look at b4. Here, as mentioned, we have to take the pawn. What happens after b5? Because this is the whole point of pushing these side pawns. Here you ignore it and you just take in e3. And here it's crucial to understand why after bishop takes in e3, black is already considered winning, even though it doesn't look like it. Position is evaluated as if black was up a piece. The reason is this. Look at the pawn structure of the black player and the pawn structure of the white player. Black plays d4 and you need to remember, when they take your knight in c6, in such type of position, you just take back with the knight and then the bishop will be attacking c5, capturing with development. This pawn cannot be defended by another pawn, so it's weakness and we will target it no matter what. So now if white takes the knight, then we take the bishop. And we're winning because we're about to take the pawn with check, So and then after knight to c6, Nothing's going to stop us from taking this this isolated c5 pawn with the bishop. We're doing just amazingly. If queen takes with swap, that's fine. King takes back. And now pawn takes in b7 just doesn't help because you're still going to play winning a move with tempo. And once again, we're going to take this c5 pawn no matter what. Besides, we also have the bishop pair. So after pawn takes back and knight c6, position is evaluated around minus 4 right now. It's a completely winning endgame. Right, so in this position, we were looking at the line in b5, pawn to b5. As mentioned, we take the pawn and then we looked at bishop takes. What happens if they take our piece instead? Right now, white is a piece. So obviously now we take the pawn with check and we are attacking an opponent piece and we also will be up. We are up in pawns. That means white will have to take this pawn. So after this capture, now black simply, very quietly, goes on with knight to c6. Black is already better, even though we've done a piece. The reason is this king is not going to live long. Right, so black is threatening to play bishop c5, super strong move. At the same time, it's also threatening queen f6, attacking the king and the rook. Nothing can really stop that from happening. And even if white tries to develop and play the best move, still knight f3, where bishop c5 check. And blocking with the bishop doesn't really help because you can play d4, too much attack. The black pawn in d4 is very well defended. And you're also threatening to push it as soon as the bishop moves. White will have to resign the material. And so after this move, if, if king goes to e1, after the bishop c5 check, black will castle. I think position here, as far as I remember, is like minus 4 or something like that. There's no way out of this trouble, even if white plays the most solid move, like bishop e2 or something like that. Still, you can't lost the right to castle. Black is going to pile up the pieces, the pressure on the pin. If, if white tries to, I don't know, play bishop to b2, it looks like it's well-placed bishop. 
uh, rook e8 check, bishop e2, either way was going to happen, black plays bishop to f5 to protect the square d3 a little bit further because we also have an attack of the queen on d3 as soon as we start pushing d4 and guess what, Not, nothing really can stop us from pushing the pawn all the way to d3 and win the game. Okay, so now we're going to look at this line, d4, d5, c4, knight c6 and now c5, okay, we play e5. They play e3, knight g to e7. So the line we're looking at now is going to be g3. The idea is to put the bishop in fianchetta where it seems to be fairly well placed. Now here black takes the pawn and after taking back fianchetto. g6 and the bishop will go to g7. And remember then, try to understand the importance of this. Because you see in chess you often have like few options. But like between the moves there could be a huge difference. For example, one could argue, you know, like there's so many moves that look good now. Knight f5, knight to g5. Uh, probably somebody might just do g6 here just to develop the bishop. But like try to remember the key principle is when your opponent has a reverse pyramid, you know the pawns want to be placed like this, like a pyramid. At the moment the white player has a backwards pawn and one pawn that advanced more than the central pawn. So it doesn't make sense. The, the pawn structure that makes sense should be something like this um, with a pawn here. Right, this would be yeah very solid and very boring, but it, you'd be much safer. Here, the problem, the reason why this is not a safe pawn structure to play, is that you have a backward pawn, and all you need to do is just attack it with minor pieces. There's only so much effort that the opponent can do to protect this pawn, and eventually they always fall. So g6, bishop g2, and bishop to g7. Now white will have to start putting employing pieces to defend the pawn. So bishop b3, and after knight to f5, it's crucial that knight to f5 came last as a move to attack this pawn because the knight could have maybe been attacked and then you couldn't have gone to f5 anymore. Whereas the bishop, I mean, no one can attack this fianchetto bishop. So after knight to f3, now furthering the defense over the d4 pawn, queen to e7 comes now pinning the bishop, making this pawn finally fall. And there's nothing now, even after queen d3, I mean queen e2 to unpin the bishop wouldn't have helped because you are still attacking this pawn anyway. The queen in d1 was defending the pawn and in e2 she's not. So let's look at this line, queen to d3 and now the knight takes the pawn, the c knight takes the pawn, it's the best move. And after take back, now black takes back with the bishop, threatening to take in b2 obviously. So after white's best move, which is the castle, it's the most active move because if we go for the pawn in b2 now, we are very backwards with development. Our bishop is not developed, our king is not castled, and rook e1 becomes a very dangerous threat. So now the best move is simply bishop takes, and after pawn takes, because the knight is defending it, now simply queen takes, check, take, take. Knight e3, we don't have to worry about the pin because of d4, and black is completely winning. The last line we're going to look at is d4, d5, c4, knight c6, c5, okay now e5. They play e3 and you play knight g2 e7. This is the move we're going to go through now which is knight to f3. Black continues with e4, double attack on the knight and this just proves that this pawn structure here is not good. So now what options does white have? Uh, of course e5 is worthless to see because I mean, you can just take, and after pawn takes back, you can play knight c6 again with another attack on the pawn, whilst you have also an attack on the pawn in c5 with the bishop. White just loses the entire integrity of the pawn center. He's got no more center. So we're going to look at two moves here, knight g5 and knight d2. Let's look at this line because it's really nice. Knight to d2, and now black plays g6. After a3 with the idea of playing b4, b5, and the, this massive expansion on the queen side, black plays bishop g7, and after b4, black knight goes to f4, 5. This is an amazing move, and it puts triple pressure over this d4 pawn. If white plays bishop to e2, for example, then simply a5. It's time to start also attacking the square b4. Especially because we're exploiting the fact that this a3 pawn is pinned, we can't take, can't take back because rook takes a1. So what happens after b5? Avoiding all of that. Obviously we all knew that b5 was coming. Okay, well, the development of the white player is not as good as black. Black center is better and now we're gonna just prove that this type of pawn structure is wrong by taking in d4. This is a sacrifice after pawn takes back, knight takes back, we've given a knight for two pawns. It's going to be a nightmare for the white player to deal with this because there's so many threats going on and black's position is just 
considered better by the engine itself. That was the best move, knight d4. After bishop to b2, black's best move is the castle, and white's best move is queen to a4, putting double attack over the knight in d4, and also developing. However, black goes on to just be better after knight to e2. Now we're up a piece. We're also threatening the bishop in b2, meaning that the white player cannot take the knight in e2. He will have to take our bishop first. However, it looks really good for white because the bishop has an attack on the rook and after king takes knight, the white player will be simplifying. Black now though plays knight to f4. This is a great move. You're threatening knight d3. Well, you save it the knight and now you're threatening to take the bishop. After knight d3 check and the queen infiltrate into h4 with an attack on f2, the pressure will be too much. So if, if let's say for example, if bishop takes rook, white is a lot up in material but black is winning after knight to d3 check and now everything loses king to d1 is met by knight b2 check and winning the queen king to f1 is met by queen f6 with a threat of check mating f2 and capturing a clean rook this queen is out of the game for the moment and after king to e2 instead same thing queen f6 attacking the rook and f2 after the white's best move according to the engine, which is rook a2, saving the rook, still queen f2 check, king moves to the only possible square, and now bishop g4 check, finishing development, and after king goes to c2, black takes the bishop back, and the white player is up a rook, however, black is completely winning, we have a threat of playing knight to c5, and after white's best move, rook to f1, attacking the queen, queen to e3, and it's some sort of zugzwang. There's no match the white can actually move here. If h3, then bishop e2 attacking the rook. Rook's only move will be rook to h1, for example. But then queen to f2 should win the game very easily for black. Remember that we have these two very strong pass pawns. Position is evaluated at minus 5 at this point. So in this position, after e4, what happens if instead white goes knight to g5? Well, obviously this is just bad because h6 the knight is forced to go to the only square which is h3 there is no sacrifice in f7 here nothing happens because this queen will be coming in, into the game fairly lonely and you can just kick it out play g6 then fianchetto white will be giving you a piece so knight h3 bishop takes pawn takes we gave up the bishop pair however we can play g6 which is really good against this type of pawn structure remember that after bishop g2 in knight to f5, see how familiar all of these patterns are. Castle, now knight to h4. This move was going to happen no matter what. And the fact that the white player has a pawn in e4 means that the queen doesn't have access to any of these squares. Well, I mean g4, but she, she will get attacked again by a pawn. And also the fact that this pawn chain is stuck here means this bishop is useless. This is going to allow us this kind of infiltration. Well, for example, queen to g4, then you just attack the queen, and after queen to g3, knight to f5, and after queen to f4, bishop h6 traps the queen. And in this position, there's nothing to stop queen g5. Let's say f3, you just ignore it, like queen g5, and you're threatening checkmate. If queen e2, obviously, to stop the checkmate, black is so much better after pawn takes in f3, the bishop is pinned, the queen can't take because of the knight, the rook will have to take, but then rook f3, knight takes check and after queen takes black is completely winning after the standing move knight d4 exploiting the e3 pin because you're threatening the bishop renewing the attack on the queen preparing to take the pawn in c5 as well 